Maybe, maybe that. Maybe, maybe if I maybe if I take it off mute. Okay. Did that work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyhow, as I, was, as I was saying, what I wanted to do, in addition to sort of talk to you about a subject that I really love, I wanted to demonstrate to you, and I hope I will during the course of the 10 or 12 times that we're together, how important this subject is for you as students who are going to be our engineers, our material scientists, our, our researchers, our writers, how important intellectual property is to you as an engineer or a material science scientist. Because I think that uh, it's fair to say that without intellectual property, there would be no engineering. There would be no material scientists. Um, and there would be no development of all of these areas um, because it's, it's really intellectual, the, the rules governing intellectual property that drive those engines. No intellectual property rights, no innovation, uh, no scientific uh, discoveries, no research because there's no incentive for it. Um, so to begin with, what I want to do is sort of give you a little bit of the framework uh, uh, of the legal framework we're dealing with. And that's the only law that we're going to talk about in this course. So maybe for 20 minutes, we'll talk about the, the legal framework that we're dealing with. Because it gives you sort of a global perspective on how, intellect, how important intellectual property rights are and the system that we've developed um, to promote intellectual property rights uh, that protect uh, the, um, uh, uh, your inventions, your inspirations, uh, your work. So what is intellectual property? So intellectual property refers to any creation of the mind, uh, such as inventions, uh, literary works, uh, uh, things that, um, anything that you can conceive and express in a tangible form uh, probably is intellectual property. Can you give me some examples of intellectual property? Give me an example of, of um, uh, literary, art, literary or artistic right, works. Anybody here like to go to the ballet? I love to go to the ballet, okay? All right, so have you ever been to a performance and they say cameras are not permitted? All right, all, all of them. One of them is that you don't want to insult the dancers by flashing things. But there's another reason for that. Uh, what you're seeing on stage is intellectual property. And for you to record that and to use it for anything other than educational purposes is a violation of the intellectual property rights of those performers, of the people that, uh, that uh, in, the, in, in Boston Ballet's case, Miko Nissanen's uh, 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 rights, or oh, the board of directors for the Boston Ballet. Any, can anybody else think of some examples of uh, intellectual property. Here's the definition. Let's see. That's a very nice watch you're wearing there, sir. What is that called? Uh, you mean the brand? Yeah, the brand. Uh, it's tag. Uh, All right. Tagger. I mean, my, my, my goodness. One of the most uh, important, most influential uh, trade names in the world of watches, OK? That's a form of intellectual property. The design of your watch, a form of intellectual property. If we were to take that watch apart and look inside and see how it's arranged, the gears, the mechanisms, there's probably 20 examples of intellectual property, either patents, trademarks, uh, inside that thing that you're wearing on your wrist. Anybody have a cell phone? More intellectual property. The software in your cell phone, how is that protected? That's a copyright. Okay, the mechanism inside, the electronics, patents. Everywhere you look, intellectual property. Okay, and that's why as material scientists or as engineers, you need to be concerned about these things. Because when you go to work for somebody and they stick a contract under your nose and, the, and, and it says that all, every, all of your inventions belong to us, you need to know what that means. The problem, the reason I'm, I'm standing up here in front of you is 13 years ago I identified what I think is a hole in the, in the curriculum at MIT. We teach you to be the best researchers and scientists and writers in the world, the very best. And then we send you out there uh, not knowing how to protect uh, the fruits of your labor, uh, your inventiveness. Um, and I hopefully at the end of this course you'll have uh, working knowledge of intellectual property sufficient to, prevent, to protect that. Because they're your ideas, they're your creations of your mind. They belong to you. And we just have to figure out how to make sure that nobody 
can take credit for what you do here at MIT and what you do beyond. Um, so intellectual property rights are like any right. They allow the creators, you, um, to benefit from the work that you've done. Uh, and you can do that by either copyright, trademark, patenting it. But there's a whole system out there of protecting these intellectual property rights. A, a global system of rules that we all follow. Uh, it's like a game that has a series of rules and that um, we've all agreed to. And those rules enable you to protect the inventions and the creations that you come up with um, uh, during the course of your career as a student or as um, uh, uh, when you matriculate out into the real world. Um, stay here as long as you can because let me tell you the real world is not all that it's cracked up to be. So if, the longer you can be students here, you know, do that. Little personal advice. Um, so this is the law stuff that I wanted to talk to you about. Actually, intellectual property, property rights go back to the Greeks. Um, there were, you know, there literally were agreements back, uh, uh, back in, the, in early uh, uh, history with the Greeks and uh, with um, uh, others that uh, involved uh, trade and commerce, uh, mostly involving, uh, you know, glass blow blowing and, and, and some metallurgy very early on. But there were, there were agreements back and forth very early, very early on. Um, uh, that sort of uh, were the, uh, the first intellectual property uh, agreements. But the, in the modern world, the uh, Berne Convention uh, and the Paris Convention are the two most important intellectual uh, property right treaties that we have. And they're still in force today. I mean, so, you know, it's, one is in 1886, one is 1983. But those, those conventions exist today and protect you even today. So if, for instance, one of you invents something and we as a class decide to perform, to put together a preliminary, preliminary patent application and we file it with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, protecting something that you've come up with here at school, well, if you decide to sell that in, in another country, the Berne Convention and the Paris Convention set up a system of rules whereby you as the inventor uh, have the protection of intellectual property rights all over the world. So not only is there a system of laws here in the United States that protects you, but as the world, be, as commerce becomes more globalized, as we trade um, uh, more and more, as the world shrinks, uh, these two uh, antediluvian laws become more and more important because uh, as the world shrinks, uh, it's important for the rules of the game to be the same everywhere. And these conventions that the United States, by the way, finally came along in 1988, kicking and screaming, and finally joined, um, uh, now are basically uh, there to protect the intellectual property rights of every inventor all over the world. Um, there's a, you know, you can look at the slide slow. We'll, we'll post it on the, um, on the website if you want to you know, drill down on what the Paris Convention means and what the Berne Convention means. But basically what they, what they do is they set up a system that governs the rules of the game. And one of the rules of the game is the first person that, to file a, pre, a preliminary patent application, the first person to create a, an artistic work or a, a work of, uh, uh, that's protected like uh, software. Um, the first one to do that, to place it in, in tangible form, is the one that owns it. Now, there's a system of registration all over the world that uh, there's one uh, uh, international system of registration, but there's also a system of registration here in the United States. But it's important to understand that, there, but th that your intellectual property rights don't depend on this international system or this, or this national system of registration. Um, and as we'll see, there are rights that, that, that supersede all of that. So in order to own a copyright or in order to own a trademark, um, you don't have to register it, um, uh, but the, and the rules all over the world are the same. And usually uh, the rule is the first one to file, the first one to express it in a tangible form is the owner of the, uh, owner of the right. Um, it, it even um, extends the United Nations Charter, um, the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. Anyone ever heard of that before? But, uh, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about uh, freedom of speech, freedom of association, pre freedom of religion, uh, basic human rights, the rights that we as, as human beings all share. 
Well, how is it that intellectual property rights made it into the International Declaration of Human Rights? Anybody want to posit a guess? How can, wh why, why did they decide to put down in writing in the UN Charter a property right as a human right? Isn't it suggestive of how fundamental that is to us as human beings? Because as human beings, one of the things we do is we create. We, we are here to be inspired and to inspire others. We're here to be creative. We're here to develop things, to advance. It's, it's as normal to us as human beings, so say at least uh, uh, the members of the General Assembly uh, and most of the people in the world, it, it's, it's as natural to us as, as breathing, as eating, as the right to, to speak freely, to express ourselves, to believe in what we want. These are all very basic human rights, and included among them is the right to express yourself and to have your inventions, the inspiration, uh, your ideas protected in some way, because that's in many ways who we are as human beings. So there's this whole sort of, uh, this. Uh, umbrella of law that um, uh, defines intellectual property rights, but it's derived from who we are as human beings. That really what you're at this institution for. When you think about it, you know, besides breathing and free speech and the right to believe what you want, what do you, what are you here for? You're here to acquire the tools to express the ideas, your, to express your creativity. It's as natural and as fundamental to each and one, every one of you as living and breathing, as eating, as believing in whatever it is that you wish to believe in. The, 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 this was not lost on the, on, the, um, on the framers of the United States Constitution either. I don't have a slide for it, but if you look at the United States Constitution, uh, there's a whole article that set forth that is really the basis of all of the intellectual property law in the United States. Why would the framers of the, why would Madison, why would Jefferson, why would Franklin, why would any of these, these uh, founders of our Constitution who were so concerned with the rights to free speech and association and religious freedom, why were, why, why were they so concerned about property rights? Because they understood besides the fact that they were all inventors, and most of them rich people because of it, but they understood that creativity is as part of being human as, it, as the ability to speak freely. And that's why it's part of our Constitution, that's why there's a Berne Convention, that's why there's a Paris Convention, that's why it's part of the uh, International Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and, you know, the slides, if you want to go back and sort of drill down, there's, I've quoted the, you know, the inter Article 27, and it talks about you know, uh, why these things are so important to us as human beings. But I think you get the idea. Um, last thing, talking about this overarching network that, of, of intellectual property rights, there's the um, WIP, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. You can actually... <laughs> Uh, go to Switzerland and look at their building, and there it is. Um, and what does the WIPO do? It's, it's sort of like in the United States, we have the United States Patent and Trademark Office, so it's a registration uh, like the United States Patent and Trademark Office. If you come up with an invention for a new thermos bottle, okay, and you file a, a preliminary patent application for it because you've come up with a better idea than the sippy thing that they have there, right? Um, and you file a preliminary patent application with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, and eventually it blossoms into a patent. And we're gonna sh I'll show you how to do that. All of you will be able to do that. Um, you can also register it here. Uh, so you can register it with the United States Patent and Trademark Office and get a patent number, and you can sell that thing, and you can write on the, on, on the thing, patented, you know? But you can also go to the WIPO and you can register it there. 
and which is a good idea because when you sell those in the United States, you have 310 million possible customers. But if you decide to sell it in China, where you have 1.4 billion, you want to have your intellectual property rights protected. If you want to sell it in Europe, which has another 350 million possible customers, you want to make sure it's registered there. So there are two registries. There's the national registry that you have uh, for your patent or trademark or copyright. And then there's the international registration uh, system that's, that's organized by the WIPO. The other thing they do is they go around the world to developing countries and they help them develop international in intellectual property laws. Uh, one of the things, for instance, that we, we want to do is we want to all be playing by the same rules. We don't want one country being an outlier and having their own intellectual property system which doesn't respect the laws and the rules of others. I'm sure you've read an awful lot about this. Uh, I've lectured in China about their developing an intellectual property system over there. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's funny, everybody complains about, you know, how China rips off our, uh, our uh, intellectual property. Do you know how Massachusetts was essentially founded? Massachusetts was founded on intellectual property rights that were stolen by Europe, uh, st stolen from Europe. The Massachusetts legislature was the first legislature uh, that used to pay a bounty uh, or a, uh, a, they called it a licensing fee, but it really was um, a receiving stolen property fee. Uh, if you were an entrepreneur and you went to uh, England and you happened to uh, be looking at their cotton gins over there or their looms and you decided, gee, this is a really good invention, and you uh, wrote it down in your notebook and you brought it back into the United States and you, uh, you, and you uh, uh, went to the legislature here, they'd give you a patent for that machine, which would exclude anyone from any of the real inventors from using it. But um, in other words, we paid people to steal intellectual property. And that's how Lowell, New Bedford, a lot of the cities in Massachusetts uh, were established based upon intellectual property uh, that was stolen from Europe. So it's a little hard sometimes for me. I always, I, they, when, I, when I say that in my lecture in China, they, you know, I get an awful lot of attention. You know, people start, start nodding in agreement um, you know, because, because they're famous for you know, um, uh, not respecting their, supposedly famous for not respecting our intellectual property rights or coercing uh, the, the giving away of intellectual property or the turning over intellectual property in return for commercial uh, deals. Uh, but, you know, uh, we, did this, we did the same thing. It's just 200 years ago we were doing it. Uh, but, uh, so one of the reasons the WIPO uh, uh, exists is to help negotiate, countries negotiate rules that they can all live by. Uh, standards that they can all live by, standards that they can share, and standards that they will respect. Because respecting those standards respects workers all over the world. If your workers are making an iPhone in, in, in one country or making an iPhone here in the United States, you'd like to think that the playing field is essentially the same in both places. And so the system of intellectual property rights helps assure the uniformity and collectively the rights of the people that not only own the, the inventions, who came up with it, but who manufacture it, and who actually work in the factories that make it. And uh, the ultimate beneficiary is who? You, the consumer. So anyhow, that's the WIPO. Um, so, um, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, two questions, uh, because from last year I was, uh, I was wondering, if there is the WIPO, why, why people still uh, patent uh, stuff uh, to the United Patent Office uh, instead of doing the global one? You mean the United States Patent Office? Yeah. Well, because in every country, the rules are a little bit different. Like, for instance, in the United States, um, while we have the same registration system, under our laws, unlike in Europe, in an infringement case, you can obtain from the infringer attorney's fees and uh, oftentimes exemplary damages. So if you can show that somebody stole your patent or your copyrighted material, uh, and you can demonstrate that it was knowing and um, willful, in the United States, you can, if you are registered here, obtain not only damages, economic damages, but you can obtain exemplary damages and attorney's fees, which is a big deal in this country because I don't know if anybody here is a, you know, like, I don't, I don't see any Jeff Bezos in here. 
costs a lot of money to hire lawyers to enforce intellectual property rights. And one of the things that stops people from disrespecting and infringing intellectual property rights is the prospect of, re of receiving attorney's fees and exemplary damages. That's unique to the U.S. system because our, our jurisprudential system is a little different here. You know, in, in Europe, for instance, the loser pays. In Canada, the loser pays. In the United States, the loser doesn't pay. Well, then, then exemplary damages, I mean, if it was just like an accident, like, for instance, if you came up with a song like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and you'd never in your life heard happy birthday before, just a coincidence, well, then you wouldn't be liable for exemplary damages. But you would probably, uh, if you, uh, if under the reasonable uh, person test, you probably, you'd have a hard time... Uh, not finding yourself um, on the losing end of an infringement case, okay? So, um, but oftentimes what happens is there, there, there are people who make a living of this. They, 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 they troll the, the patent and trademark office. They look it for inventions, and they, they out, they, we'll talk all about this. Um, they steal them. That's their, that's their business model. Um, and so one of the things that... that United States law is set up to do, if you register, um, is to protect you, give you a little bit more protection than you would get in France, or you would get in Japan, or you get in South America. So that's why you register you know, in the host country. You want to take advantage of the little differences that sometimes make important, uh, are very important um, in, each, in each jurisdiction. Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess we could talk about that later. But I had a question related to Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. All right. So if you watch Batman or any of these animated cartoons, they have the Mad Hatter character, which is clearly a ripoff of Lewis Carroll's writing. Yeah. So how does Warner Brothers not get sued for the copyright? Well, uh, we'll go into fair use, but it's, it has to do with fair use. Um, and there's a lot of aspects uh, of fair use. It also has to do with changes. So if, if, the, if the similarities are so strong, but they have to almost be identical in order for you to be considered an infringer, um, if, if, if that if they're not identical, it's oftentimes very difficult to uh, prove infringement. The reason why is because what we want to do in setting up this body of law is if somebody comes up with a slightly better design for the thermos with a sippy uh, thing, um, we want to promote that innovation. Okay, so even though it looks very similar, even though you know the tube is still round, but maybe you you know have figured out a way to lengthen the tube or place it in the in the body of the thermos that creates some benefit. Um, so a slight change, any slight change is considered creativeness, okay? Um, and if it changes or improves in any way the original design, and I'm talking about a patent right now. Um, then there's no infringement. Now, in the case of a literary work, uh, again, um, oftentimes it comes down to um, uh, images, colors that are used. Uh, I've had cases where, you know, using your example of the Mad Hatter, we fought over the size of the hat or the brim size or the, or the face of the Mad Hatter. Uh, the idea is the, 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 the party accusing who owns the property right wants to say that somebody else is copying them. Well, what they have to do is show substantial similarity. And if there's not substantial similarity, there's no infringement. So the person that borrows said, well, I've improved on the Mad Hatter. Uh, my Mad Hatter is, uh, is madder. Uh, and you can tell uh, that I didn't copy this because the brim on the hat is six inches instead of two inches. 
and the nose on the Mad Hatter. I mean, look at the Mad Hatter in Lewis Carroll, but the Mad Hatter here is completely has a different design. So I'm not infringing. And the, and it comes down, it'll come down to a jury. A jury will decide under the substantial similarity test whether there's infringement or not. Is that trademark or is that? It can be both. Um, if it is a, if for instance you use, let, let's say uh, you have a hat company, and you decide to use the Mad Hatter as the Mad as the as the company. Um, logo, then it can be a logo for your company. If you're Lewis Carroll and you're writing books, the Mad Hatter uh, character is protected by copyright. So, so oftentimes there are overlapping protections of these things. Oftentimes if you come into my office and I give you advice and you have a brilliant idea, I'll have you not only trademark it, but I may have you copyright it at the same time. I may not, I may have you, you, you may be covered under patent and, and, and trademark law. So, you know, there's, there's overlapping protections. And in order to promote advancement in culture and in science and in technology, we don't penalize people for making improvements on things. If you can show an improvement, then it advances our goal as a society to allow you to profit from that. And, 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 it, and it equally helps us not to allow people that own patents to stifle technology or development by overreaching uh, or getting more protection than they deserve. Uh, my question is, for example, Pinkate, I've got a uh, invention patented in the US. Uh -huh. uh, so does the infringer who is in the US would only be taken care of or anybody around the world? Well, uh, it, it, it depends on the circumstances. You know, one thing I learned in law school is the answer to all. You, know, you want to know the right answer to every question in this class? It depends. <laughs> okay? I know this is very difficult for you as engineers, but actually, actually, as engineers, I think you'll find, Brian will tell you this, and Professor Eagle will tell you this, in many, in many cases, even in engineering, that's the right answer. It depends. But in, in law, the right answer to the question is always, it depends. Um, in a case where there's infringement, usually where you would bring suit is where, you, where the damage is being done. So where you're being hurt is where, now let's say you own a patent here in the United States uh, that, that also is recognized under the Paris Convention in France. Or let's say you own, let's say you've written a book and you find it being published in France. Well, um, you can, under, under the laws that we've talked about, you can go to France and hire an avocat and have the avocat, you know, f send a French cease and desist letter to the people that are publishing your book and you can sue for damages in France because their system of France and the United States are signatories to the Berne Convention and you're protected there as well as you're protected here. There's a really interesting um, uh, uh, case we'll talk about later on involving the Book of Mormon and the Bible. Uh, and how uh, those intellectual property rights have been in, enforced over, over uh, territorial boundaries. And how actually the, the Book of Mormon was saved by, and, and Mormonism was saved by intellectual property rights. We'll talk about that later. One last question. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, so the difference between the national and the international patent is that in case of international, it will definitely be applied to all, all over the world. As long as you're a signatory to the Berne Convention. One of the reasons why you can buy certain drugs, okay, um, that are sold in the United States through the mail from places like Argentina uh, or other places in South America is because they're not signatories to the Berne or the, uh, or the Paris conventions. And, they, and what they do is they, they take pharmaceuticals that take, cost billions to be made here in the United States and they knock them off down there and they sell them through the mail. It's a big problem for ph pharmaceutical companies here. Uh, certain companies will take advantage of the fact that they, that, that they, 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 uh, they uh, establish themselves in jurisdictions where, there's, where it's kind of like the Wild West. And it's a big problem for companies up here enforcing those intellectual property rights. So they go where there's an advantage. You know, so it, it depends on, on where the infringer is and, and so forth. You know, there's a whole, that's a whole thing. Um, somebody had... relevant if there's grad students or if students write an undergrad thesis. So I got um, some emails from a publisher in Germany a few years after I had written my thesis here wanting to public basically buy the thesis. 
and publish it in Germany, but MIT owns the copyright. So if you if something to look out for if you have to do it. If you had had the benefit of this course while a student at MIT, you could have gone down to the MIT uh, Intellectual Property Office and probably negotiated yourself a better deal. At least I would hope you would have. Or you could say, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Lyons. He'd like to have a talk with you. Um, because, you know, one of the things that, that you really, one of the things that really burns me uh, is, is sometimes the way institutions enforce these, these agreements that they have with students that have no idea what, um, what they're signing on to. Uh, one of the things is hopefully at the, at the end of this course, you'll be aware of the, that sort of stuff. But, you know, that's a perfect example. You guys got to be aware of the stuff that we, you create here. The, the rights that the institution um, has to the, to the product of your creativity. It's, there's one example of it. Yes? So, let's suppose that, for instance, I invent a new battery that is extremely better than the lithium, than the lithium one. Okay. And I bought a picture to the USBO. Right. And the company decides to go to an out of the jurisdiction uh, country, produce their batteries, and put it in their uh, phone or cars or whatever, and sell the cars as product. They can do it, right? Can they? Well, if, if they license your technology, yes. Without license. I mean, uh, if they go in a company out of the jurisdiction, that's, where that's, that's where you come down to one international place and come to the eighth floor and see me. Um, uh, that's that, that, I think that's a, a, an example of in, you know of infringement. You know, I, I, I you know unless unless they're paying you a licensing fee to use your technology, unless you know of course you know um, uh, Elton Musk just gave away all of his patents. All of his Elton Musk I think what a week ago, just said it's all yours. It's all free. All of that battery technology. So I don't know how much your battery technology is worth now that Elton uh, Musk has said you can have all my battery technology for free. <laughs> I, I, it's a good thing because Elton Musk, who's the leader in the world, just gave all of his away. Why did he do it? Is he a nice guy? Is Elton Musk a nice guy? Is he, just, is he one of the nice billionaires out there? Why do you think he did it? What's he, what's he in the business of? Well, what's he in the business? What does he do? Marketing, all of his. What, what, does he, what does he sell? Cars. Okay. What does somebody want to do that sells cars? They want to sell as many cars as possible, right? Well, he owns the electric car market. All right. His cars cost between thirty and seventy-five thousand dollars. Probably a little higher end than that, right? A fancy one, yeah. Well, how many people can afford those cars in the world? It's a limited number of people, right? Well, what if he, now Ford says, gee, I'd like to build a $20,000 car or a $10,000 car, but I can't because Elton Musk owns all these patents. Elton Musk will sue me, so I am not going to build electric cars. Elton Musk knowing that holding on to these intellectual property rights will inhibit the development of technology and markets that could benefit him, gives it all away. Why? Because a rising tide lifts all boats. We'll all be driving electric cars because the technology that goes into them is now free. You know, Ford has gotten rid of the Focus. The, every single small car that they've been selling for the last 25 years. All the little cars, gone. 2020, you won't be able to buy one of those. Everybody's going to be buying, every, they're going to be making nothing but electric. GM has done the same thing. And the reason why is because Toyota and Tesla and a number of other companies, BMW, that own this electro electronic and hydrogen technology, have seen that if they hold on to these intellectual property rights, it'll inhibit the development of markets elsewhere. So they rather would give this technology away so that, they, so that the entire market gets larger and they'll have a larger percentage of a larger market. That's why 
It's not because he's a nice billionaire. I don't think, there's an, I don't think there is a such thing as a nice billionaire, but that's only because I've never met one. When a billionaire is given something away, there's a reason for it besides they're a nice guy or a nice girl, nice person, okay? And that's the reason. A rising tide lifts all boats. Elton Musk understands if he makes this technology available to you, somebody in this class will go out and build an electric car that's better than what he's come up with, that'll expand the marketplace and create more opportunities for him. That's why. Um, so intellectual property law in the United States, Title 17 of the United States Code uh, has to do with copyrights. Title 15, the Lanham Act is trademark, uh, and Title 35 is um, patent law. Those are the, you, you've probably seen on TV when you're watching TV, it's like um, Title 35, United States Code, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's what that is. This, is. this is from the United States Code. There's a system of statutes that Congress has passed from Title I to, you've heard of Title IX, you know, of discrimination and, and equality of, of, of opportunity. There's a whole system of statutory laws in the United States, and Title 17, Title 15, and Title 35 are the ones that deal with intellectual property. Um, all right, so I just got sort of talking about this, but why should we, why should we recognize intellectual property rights? What, what reason? What, what, what good is it to us to, to recognize intellectual property rights? Come on, somebody I haven't heard from yet. I want to learn everybody's name. Give me a break. Somebody raise a hand. There, right up. Look at that. Brave woman. Hmm? Incentivizes right. Incentivizes development. How does it incentivize? Let's, let's, let's drill down on this. How does it incentivize? You're the inventor. How does it incentivize development? Well, you know that it might be expensive to develop it up front, but if you know that it can be protected and that you might be able to make someone back, then you're more willing to invest time and money into it. Have another blueberry muffin. It's the best answer you could possibly give. <coughs> let, let, you, you come up here. Honestly, that, that's exactly why we do it. That's exactly why we do it. Um, give, me another, give me another reason. So this is progress of humanity, OK? Oh, sure. I'm, I, I, I hope to do it as well. And what's your first name? Claudia. I hope to do it as well as Claudia did. But it incentivizes uh, uh, the development of technology. If an inventor understands that their invention is going to be protected, that they're going to be able to exploit uh, in the marketplace their, their invention for a period of time in order to recoup their investment, then they have an incentive to go ahead and, and develop that technology. Why would anybody spend money developing a better thermos and sippy cup if as soon as you put it on the market, somebody could copy it? and get the benefit of all the money that you spent developing that, that technology. <coughs> How would anything, we'd still be <laughs> driving around the cars that, you know, Flintstones were driving around in if we didn't incentivize people to come up with better and more efficient and uh, more useful inventions. There's, there's no incentive to develop. Science, remember what I said? What you do depends on intellectual property. Science would grind to a halt. And I can show you, we'll talk about the studies later on. Why do I tell you the story of, um, of uh, graphene? Uh, I'm going to make this whole class relevant to material science because uh, there, there are a million examples, but most of you are material science students, so I'm going to, talk, I'm going to tell you the story of graphene. And, and it's an analog for everything that goes on in the world of uh, material science. So. Um, Courageous commitment to, and you know, this is an ancillary benefit, you know, uh, jobs from the people that work in the factories to the engineers that are hired to exploit the technology and improve on it, to the sales clerk that sits down with me and <coughs> has to explain the technology in order to sell me the thing, to the, you know, everyone down the chain benefits from it. Um, as entrepreneurs, as inventors, you're job creators. Um, and again, why should we promote intellectual property rights? Having an efficient intellectual property system that everybody respects 
creates an even playing field. There are rules that we can all follow uh, that uh, I think work very well with the way um, the world is um, the world is going is, is shrinking these days. Um, consumers are confident in the product. When when I buy a thermos, uh, a stainless steel thermos with uh, a fancy sippy cup, I can depend on that product doing what it says it does. Because the United States Patent Office has examined it, seen that it actually does what it claims to do. So I, as a consumer, when I, when I, when I pick that brand, can have confidence in that brand. Um, I know that even though it's manufactured in another country, it's in a country that conforms to the same laws and rules and regulations and rules of the game that my country does. So I know that that stainless steel is not radioactive, okay? That the plastic does not degrade or cause, uh, uh, cause uh, contamination. You know, there's, uh, there, there are all kinds of benefits to, to consumers. It's reliable. It's, uh, 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 it's safe. Uh, uh, it, it was made uh, in accordance with certain standards. Um, okay. Um, so, what are the types of intellectual property rights? I want to end our class today with a little game. Okay. So these are the types of intellectual property rights. Everybody's heard of a patent. Anybody know what a patent is? What, is, what does a patent cover? Anybody? Anybody Google it really fast? It's inventions. Uh, Anything, anything like this, this computer, now I've done it. Um, any, any physical object can be, um, is patentable. It'll come back eventually. Hopefully. If it doesn't, I don't get to play the game. <laughs> Oh, okay. Because I really want to play the game. Close your eyes. I don't want you to see this. Okay. So, these are the types of intellectual property. Patents are any sort of device or invention, something in a physical form. Uh, that box back there can be patented. This table, these chairs, all subject to patents. Sometimes many different patents in one item. Copyrights, anything in a written form. Whether it happens to be the works of Lewis Carroll or um, software that you write as an engineer. It can either be on a piece of paper where, with pen or it can be stored on the hard drive of a, of a computer. As, as a form of computer code. All of that is copyrightable. Um, trademarks, um, the Lewis Carroll character, the Mad Hatter, uh, General Motors, Coca-Cola, Pepsi. Uh, what does it say on your shirt back there? Stanford? How'd you get in here? Couldn't get, in, couldn't get into a good school, huh? Yeah. Stanford, okay. I'll guarantee that that's trademarked, okay? Everybody look at his trademark sweater. Um, there's an example of a trademark. Trade secrets. Anybody, can, can anybody think of a trade secret? What's the difference between a trade secret and a patent, a trademark, and a copyright? Wow, oh, great one. Oh, you ruined my surprise next time. I usually bring in the uh, Coca-Cola bottle and the Pepsi bottle. But exactly, the formula for Coca-Cola is a trademark. Now, why do they keep it as a trademark? Uh, excuse me, as a trade secret. What would happen if you wrote it down? <laughs> exactly. You have to get, they actually keep it in a safe at Coca-Cola headquarters in Atlanta. That's a trade secret. A trade secret has to be two things. It has to be secret and have to ha it has to have commercial value. Uh, lots of times, there is a disadvantage to registering something as a trademark or copyright or, a pat or, or as a patent because everybody knows what it is. And the minute you disclose, um, you know, the secret formula of Coca-Cola. So there are a lot of things like that, recipes, for instance. Um, but there are a lot of other applications for that uh, that, you, that, that, that we'll talk about. But yeah, there, as long as it has commercial value and you keep it in a safe, and, and that's a trade secret. That's All right, so, yes. Why don't 
Well, you'd be surprised most of them do. Because a recipe normally uh, is not patentable uh, or, or um, copyrightable. Uh, you know, uh, chocolate chip cookies, it's, it's, it's dough and chocolate chips. Those are the kinds of things that ordinarily are not protectable as a trademark. But if you have some unique way of combining the ingredients or some proportion that's different, even though you can't necessarily protect it as a, as a trademark or copyright or patent, you still might want to treat it uh, as proprietary information because it's an advantage over your competitors. So that's why you buy a safe and you write it down and you put it in the safe and you don't let anybody else in the company look at it other than you and maybe one of the members of the board. That's literally how it works. Um, yes? Non-competes? Well, they do fit in in, in a way. Um, one of the things that, for instance, you're going to want to do in order, let's say you're an entrepreneur and you have an invention and you want to uh, uh, exploit this invention. Um, but you need to hire more people to work with you in order to get this off the ground and, and, to, and to commercially exploit it. Well, one of the things you're going to want to do is you want to, have, you want to have everyone in the group that you assemble sign non-disclosure agreements so that they can't go out and talk about your invention. And also, you probably want to have them at the same time sign a non-compete agreement so that they can't go across the street and either start their own company or go to work for somebody else who is a competitor of yours and disclose what they learned from you. So, Non-competes and, and non-disclosure agreements go hand in hand with intellectual property rights. They're very important. They're part of the practical application of intellectual property rights and, and their enforcement. So this is what you need to know when you come out of here today. The one thing you need to know is what types of property can be protected, okay? And what can't be protected. This is the golden rule of intellectual property. So listen to this if you've listened to nothing else. The expression in a tangible or fixed form of an idea, but not the idea itself. Okay, so in order for you to protect, be able to protect or have a right in an intellectual, in intellectual property, it, your idea, the thing in your head, is not protected. If, we, if you have a great idea, and you go to a bar and you have too many drinks and you tell somebody, a stranger that you just met, you just had this great idea how you can make computers um, a thousand times faster. And they go out and they use your idea. You'll go through the rest of your life saying, I was the one that thought that up. But you'll never be able to enforce that intellectual property right because you never took that idea and expressed it in tangible form. The idea must, in order to be protected, must be expressed in tangible form. You can't say, that's my idea, you stole my idea, because there's no stealing of ideas. Ideas are free. But if you express it in tangible form, write it on a computer and, and have it part of a hard drive, take a piece of paper and write, it, write the formula down, or the idea down, uh, build a working model, as long as that idea is expressed in tangible form, it's protectable. It doesn't have to be registered. You own it. It's yours. You, can, you own the property right to it. So I want to, the game I wanted to play with you is the game of, OK, is it protectable or is it not protectable? OK? So these are the things that can't be protected, all right? Um, a thought or an idea which has not been expressed in fixed or tangible form. Generally available methods. Uh, like, for instance, um, systems of measurements, tools to, you, to measure, like rulers or calendars. Um, the um, laws of thermodynamics are not copyrightable or patentable. Um, gravity, not, not patentable, not, dis, not, uh, pr not protectable. The fact that there are 12 inches in a, in a foot, not protectable. Um, business procedures. Uh, the other day you learned about uh, total quality control. Is, to, is, is the idea of total quality control uh, uh, protectable as intellectual property? Professor Eager lectures all over the world. You people sat through the lectures on total quality control or you are sitting through them. Is, that, is the idea of total quality control uh, subject to intellectual property protection? Not until it's expressed in a fixed or tangible form. When you write a book about it, 
it's copyrightable. When you put a slideshow up on it, that's protectable. But the idea of total, to total quality control is not protectable. It has to be expressed in a fixed or tangible form. Uh, business or phone books, uh, they're because they're considered directories. But if you take the phone book and you reorder it, that's protectable. As long as there's the slightest bit of expression in a fixed or tangible form or the slightest bit of improvement or creativity added to it, it's protectable. All right, here's a game. Well, uh, who, did, who, who uh, was the first to uh, discover gravity? <laughs> well, you mean gravity didn't exist before Newton? <laughs> you know, it has to be an invention, okay? It can't be a discovery, okay? Um, it has to, you know, a, 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 a law of nature precedes most of us. Okay, the original, it's hard to find the original inventor of gravity. You have to go back a long way. Yes? Can you copyright like an explanation? Of yes, sure. Um, you know, uh, Principia, you know, Newton's you know, book, I don't want to tell you how it ends, it's a great book, uh, but uh, copyrightable, okay? But, you know, so he describes uh, these, these things, um, and that book is copyrightable, but the, the scientific principles that he describes are not. All right, so here's the game. Tell me whether it's protected or not. Artistic performances, we talked about the ballet. Yeah, gee, we already talked about this one. All right, yes, right? Everybody knows, everybody's, yes, absolutely, absolutely, okay. And the answer is, performances can be copyrighted, but only if they are original and taped, notated or transcribed, why? Fixed expression, fixed expression, exactly. Take a picture of it, copyrightable. Sit there and enjoy it, have it in your head, not, okay. Make a movie of it, protect it, okay. Articles of clothing, well, we have a Stanford t-shirt back here, okay. Um, we have a tag her watch, but I don't see, oh, Yale? Oh, Kale, <laughs> even better. Even better. Somebody came up with that. Okay. Is that protectable? Why? It's intangible form. The answer is, while copyright protection is offered to visual art and architecture, fashion is usually not protected by copyright. Okay. And by that I mean a shirt that has two arms and a, and a neck hole. Okay. That, that's kind of universal. But if you write Stanford or Kale or something on it, or MIT, then you may have a trademark or a copyright. So I don't know if anybody has a Burberry coat around here, but everybody, you know, you've seen the, the plaid pattern. That's something that's protectable, okay? Something unique. All right, words, words and phrases. Yes? Give me an example. Oh, words and, well, words and phrases. Well, exactly. How about have it your way? How about education is the accidental byproduct of uh, discussion fueled by curiosity? That's my copyrighted phrase. I thought that up. You go to the United States uh, Patent and Trademark Office, you'll find that I've copyrighted that. I've written it in a book or a paper, whatever. Um, so uh, the answer is, while words are considered part of the public domain and are not normally protected by the law of intellectual property, names, symbols, logos, devices, slogans, you know, that kind of stuff, are all subject to trademark protection. That MIT logo on your um, vest uh, has a specific design. Uh, it stands for something. It has, according to some people, value. So that is protectable, okay? That particular design, okay? So that's a, an example of a word or phrase or logo that's protectable. All right, business ideas. God, we've already done all these things. I gotta, I gotta become a better storyteller. Business ideas. No, exactly, unless? Unless you write it down, write it down. Um, uh, I, I like to end with uh, famous uh, successes and fizzles. Uh, YouTube, uh, big success. Bought for 1.65 billion. Today it's worth between 27 and 40. Tells you how old this is. It's closer, worth closer to 100 billion now. 
But then if you look at, uh, anybody old enough to know what Friendster is? No. When I wrote, when I wrote this lecture originally, I, there were at least some people that knew what Friendster was. Um, it was bought uh, for, by, uh, uh, by Facebook for uh, 1.49 million. It's worth literally zero. Um, so some ideas, when they're expressed in tangible form, become valuable. Others, not so much. Um, we already talked about trade secrets. Next time I'm going to tell you, this is an homage to the best lawyer I ever met in my whole life. His name was Gordon Hampton. He was about that high, about that wide. Um, he taught me how to be a trial lawyer. I tried cases with him uh, actually all over the world. I tried a famous case with him in uh, the high courts of Hong Kong once. And he was the most unassuming little man. Um, they did books about him. John Mortimer did a series of books about him called, John, uh, called Rumpel of the Bailey. He was educated at the University of Edinburgh. He spoke Latin, uh, Greek, uh, all the dead languages fluently. He spoke, he spoke Shakespeare like, like I curse. Uh, he was really one of the most amazing men I've ever met in my whole life. And he was the most unassuming man you ever saw in your whole life. But he struck fear into the hearts of every witness he was about to cross-examine. And it's because he used to carry around with him this wrinkled old green Harrods bag. And as he'd cross-examine the witness, he'd go into the bag and he'd start rummaging around. And the witness would be absolutely terrified about what he was going to pull out of that bag because he knew the question was about to reveal a secret that the witness didn't want, didn't want to uh, reveal. So I always carry around. This is my version of the, of the rumpled uh, Harold's, Harold's, Harrods uh, shopping bag that, uh, that my very good friend Gordon Hampton, who's no longer with us, uh, would be very proud, though, to hear his name mentioned in this class that I carry on with me. And what I'm bringing out today is our subject for our next class. Anybody see, ever see one of these before? Um, do you know what it is? OK. This is, an app of this, this is an example of an everyday thing, an example of intellectual property that we'll talk about next time. Uh, I want you to guess, if you can, without going on Google uh, next Tuesday and tell me how many examples of intellectual property are represented by this little bag. No looking on Google, because that's how I found out. But I want you to sit down and actually think about the types of intellectual property that are represented by this bag. And we're going to start our class off next week by your telling me uh, what types of intellectual property are represented by this little bag. Thank you for coming to this lecture. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to doing this with you every week at least twice, and on Fridays having breakfast with you. So thanks a lot. Okay. See you next time, I hope. Cheers.